My name is Drew Weger, and here's my buyer's guide for the Mark II Golf. Mark II Golf has been around for many years now. Even the youngest ones uh, were made in, uh, last made in 1992. So it's an old car and you need to treat it like a classic car. Uh, even though it looks fairly modern in some ways, it really is a pretty old car and you need to bear that in mind when you're buying one. So why would you be looking to buy a Mark II Golf? Well, it's an up and coming classic. They're getting quite rare here in the UK and uh, their prices are increasing dramatically. So this video is kind of aimed at people who want to buy one for purposes of uh, owning an original car, uh, potentially with a view to uh, keeping it collected and in good condition for the future. Uh, if you want to buy one for modification and fun, then you certainly can do so. Uh, there aren't so many of them left, it's going to be a more and more expensive option for you. Uh, you might be better off spending money on something newer. Um, but uh, a good condition Mark II in standard trim like the one we've got here is becoming a rare and valuable thing. And if you want one, you're going to have to move fairly quick before prices go completely stratospheric. But this video is aimed at telling you what you need to look for. Now there is quite a lot of rubbish talked about the Mark II Golf in terms of its spec and its performance and so on and so forth. Um, some of it peddled by uh, respectable motoring organisations. I've seen videos from CarWow and Car Throttle who've got all the basic facts completely wrong. So just for any absence of doubt, here are the basic specs for all the models of the Mark II Golf. Starts off with the bottom of the range C model, which is a 1.3, 1272cc engine with 55 brake horsepower. If you had a little bit more money, you'd go up to a CL or a driver. Both of those have the 1.6 engine, which is 1595cc, has 75 brake horsepower. Above that, you could add a little bit of luxury and go for the Golf GL. That had a 1.8 litre engine uh, with 1781cc and 90 brake horsepower. And all of these cars so far have been carburetted engines. Okay, fuel injection was only available on the GTI models at this stage. Uh, above the GL is the basic 8-valve GTI. That's 112 brake horsepower, same cylinder capacity, 1781cc, with an eight valve fuel injected engine. Top of the range effectively is like the 16 valve car we have here, which is 139 brake horsepower, same cylinder capacity still, 1781cc, but with a 16 valve head on the top. There are a few rarer models. There's a uh, G60 model, which is effectively a supercharged eight valve Golf with 160 brake horsepower. Um, there is the four wheel drive rally version, which has the same engine. Um, with a slightly smaller cylinder capacity. And the absolute top of the tree is the G60 Limited, which was also a four-wheel drive Golf, which looks very, very ordinary from the outside, only has a signal headlamp grille, but does feature a supercharged 16-valve engine, again, with the same cylinder capacity, but with over 200 brake horsepower. Those ones really are rather rare, um, and uh, you will struggle to find one uh, at all. And if you do find one, it will be really expensive. So bear that in mind. In terms of values of these cars, it's impossible to really put a value on this video. Um, a car like the one that you've got here in front of me now is probably worth at least eight to 10,000 uh, pounds in the condition that it's currently in. The lesser models will sell for less and the more expensive models will sell for more. And those prices are about right uh, for when this video is being put out, which is mid 2021. Uh, expect the prices to continue to go up. It's a very collectible car and the good condition ones are now becoming few and far between. So bear that in mind uh, as you're going. So uh, you're probably starting entry level for something scruffy, maybe three, four thousand pounds, something in really good condition, seven to eight, and something that's absolutely spectacular, 12 to 15 upwards. Now the Mark II Golf is pretty old car. The latest ones came out in 1991, 1992. Um, and as such, you need to treat them as any other classic car. Uh, they are old. Uh, they will have done quite a lot of miles for the vast majority of them, easily over 100,000. They're quite capable of doing that sort of mileage if they're looked after, but the question is, are they being looked after? Now you'll not be surprised to find that the key issue on a car of this age is rust. Now the key areas to look for, the first one is very easy to spot. It's the scuttle where the windscreen wiper arms come out of the bodywork. If you see any rust on a car around here, my advice would to you would be walk away. Uh, it's very expensive to fix. It's a structural part of the car. Uh, and if you can see surface rust here, you can guarantee it's gone a lot further into the car. It can be fixed, but it's not all that easy to do. And the car is never quite the same after the event. The other key area is particularly on the GTI. 
are the wheel arches. Now the front wings detach and are relatively easy to replace but you're going to be ending up probably with pattern parts at this stage of the car's life. Um, but these black plastic trims, while they're 80s tastic, can hide a multitude of sins. This example is a, a small bumper variant, but the same thing applies. Um, anywhere this trim attaches is a water trap. The water sits in contact with the bodywork and um, it rusts. Uh, so these wheel arch trims, um, it's quite difficult to inspect if you're looking at a car directly because um, you, know, you can't obviously ask the owner to take the wheel arch trims off to have a look. But have a feel in and behind here just to get a feel. This one's got a little bit of mud on it, unfortunately. But if it's not solid and it's not secure underneath there, um, again, uh, particularly if it's the back ones, uh, because obviously the back panels are much going to be much, much more prone to problems. Um, if it's anything at all crusty or going through here, um, again, you've got a potentially big bill on your hands. Um, and if you can avoid it and you've got a choice of cars, again, I would walk away. There is a particular problem at the back of a Golf, um, underneath the sills, under here. Um, as the mounting points for the rear beam can get very, very badly corroded. And you need to check underneath the sills as well. Um, I'm due to get this car wax oil to make sure that it gets protected. It's pretty good under here, to be honest. But check under the sills, front and back, all the way along the sides of the car, on both sides, and look for any holes here um, as well. Rear valance. Now, you can see them on the small bumper cars. You can't see them on the big bumper cars. Um, can get rusty as well. And uh, that's a, another problem that you need to, to bear in mind. But that's quite visible and easy to see. The front valance, again, small bumper cars, um, can pick up a lot of stone chips, so check for rust here. Again, a reasonably easy panel to replace, um, but it um, can be problematic. You see, I haven't actually managed to work on this one yet. I've got a small uh, piece of rust developing there. Very, very common, nothing too uh, bad to worry about. Make sure you have a look at all the panel gaps and the alignment of the panels. Um, you shouldn't be seeing anything strange and unusual here. Panel gaps should be straight and even. They won't be quite as close as a modern car due to improved manufacturing, but um, they should look straight and uh, without any obvious deformations at all. Make sure that's tidy. You don't want your car to be one that's uh, been in the bash and been poorly repaired. Now, one of the key things you need to look for in terms of originality is here in the boots. Um, uh, if you're buying a Golf as a collector, um, you need to see this sticker. This is the option sticker in the boot. It shows that the rear panel hasn't been changed since the car was made. If that sticker isn't there as a collector, um, it's kind of game over for the car you're looking at. You need to have that as proof of originality um, and it uh, does add a bit of value to your Golf. So make sure that that sticker is there. It may not even be all that intelligible. You can get reprints of it, uh, but do make sure it's there on the left hand side of the back panel. What you also want to see is an intact rear parcel shelf. So in the 80s and 90s, these were hacked apart, people putting six by nine speakers in them. Um, again, if you haven't got one of these, um, collectible value of the car is a little bit less. You can buy them, but they are very expensive now. Um, so bear that in mind uh, when you're purchasing your car. Now, one of the other things to consider when you're buying a Mark II Golf is uh, the normal recommendation for cars, of course, is to try and buy something that's standard. You're going to find that really difficult with a Mark II Golf. Um, vast majority of them have been modified in one way or another. Um, I've been working for a year and a bit on this one to get it back to standard, and I still haven't quite finished. Um, so you will find custom exhausts, uh, lowered suspension, um, unusual alloy wheels, changes to lights. Um, there are a plethora of performance parts that you may find under the bonnet um, and you will find a uh, Every golf that you look at will have some sort of modification or other the, the key thing for you to figure out is can you reverse the mod easily and is the standard part that is missing? Uh, easy to find um, Most stuff isn't too bad. You can still get lights rear lights um, uh, You know exhausts and so on and so forth relatively straightforwardly some stuff is getting harder trim items um, things like the beasting aerial bits and pieces like that will be getting harder uh, you're going to have to pay second-hand prices for alloy wheels um, and probably refurbish them yourselves um, and little bits of trim um, are getting are getting um, harder and harder to find for example this gutter trim here 
is hen's teeth now, the one that runs down the A-pillars um, and goes to the back of the car, that's quite hard to find. And things like the mechanism for the sunroof, as you can see here, um, I've just recently repaired this one. Um, they are, again, quite expensive and getting quite awkward to find. Now, moving into the interior of the car. You should find, hopefully, a well-presented engine bay. Um, on the Mark II, what you're looking for initially, the first thing I'd look at is that this front slam panel here is not body coloured. Okay, it should be black. It's important that it's black because that means the front end of the car hasn't been damaged and resprayed. This is a 16 valve engine car, and as GTI goes, uh, you've got 8 valve or 16 valve options and a few rarer stuff like the G60. Um, to be honest, between the 8 valve and the 16 valve, there isn't a vast amount of difference in performance, maybe half a second 0 to 60 and a little bit higher top speed. Um, but you're buying the car on condition. Uh, in terms of drivability, none of these cars are fast anymore. Don't expect it to keep up with any kind of modern hot hatch or even close. In fact, a Mark II GTI won't even keep up with a normal turbo diesel today. Um, yeah, performance has moved on, but that's not the reason you're buying this car anymore. Um, so what you want is an example that's in good condition. It's very important to have a look at the engine to find out what uh, is going on under the bonnet. Now this one's averagely tidy, it's not concourse, but it's, it's okay. And what you want to see is an engine in good health. What you really don't want to see is any oil leaks. Now if you see down here, you can see it's a little bit mucky, but there is nothing dripping. Uh, you don't want to see any oil leaks. Uh, Mark II Golf shouldn't leak unless there's something wrong with it. Um, and so it's important to have a good look under there. You don't want to see any oil leaks, anything mucky. Um, discoloured um, uh, water bottle here, that's fairly normal, that's simply age. Uh, most of the other stuff you want to expect to be intact as well. Pay particular attention to these fueling lines on the 16 valve um, and the general condition of uh, hoses. Um, many of these Mark II's are running on borrowed times with their hoses because they're old and perished and haven't been replaced. Uh, this is a fairly standard radiator, it's only a single fan on that one. Uh, bear that sort of stuff in mind as well. And you're looking for evidence that the car is in good condition. But again, double check this front slam panel. This is very important to show that the car has not been in a front end shunt. What you also don't want to see is any rippling of these inner wings. Uh, these are actually obviously structural parts of the car. Um, any damage to the uh, suspension turrets on either side. So have a good, good poke around here. Uh, ideally, you want to see the original uh, airbox and induction system. Um, lots of people change these, obviously, for aftermarket bits and pieces. But to be honest, they don't do anything on the Mark II. And uh, you're best off with the original induction system as designed by Volkswagen. These cars are actually quite noisy. And if you take off some of this stuff, actually, they get incredibly noisy. So depending on what kind of noise and experience you're after you may want to consider that um, so this one does have the original airbox uh, in place the other thing to bear in mind is that this is quite an old car um, and it has in the case of the gti a relatively primitive fuel injection system uh, but if it's set up correctly it's incredibly reliable When you turn the ignition on, you should hear the fuel pump priming there. You should see a couple of red lights on the dashboard. Push the clutch in. You should not need any accelerator to start the car. The car should idle steadily at about 800, 900 RPM uh, with no input from you as a driver at all. And it should stay rock solid like that. If you're looking at a GTI and it doesn't start on the key, without any throttle uh, and it doesn't idle like that, there is something wrong with it and you need to factor that into your buying considerations. The fuel injection system on 8-valve and 16-valve GTIs is um, fully mechanical except for the later Digifant ones which are 8-valve only. From about 1989 onwards there was an electronic fuel injection system which is somewhat more reliable in some ways uh, and certainly more fuel efficient, but does uh, lose the car a little bit of verve, shall we say, and make it a little bit less responsive. So again, depending on what you're after, um, the early eight valves have mechanical K-Jet fuel injection, 
the later ones have digifant. The 16 valve, as we have here, had uh, K-Jet fuel injection throughout its entire life until it was retired. These cars do not have cats, so they are pre-cat cars. So you don't need to worry about emissions too much when it comes to MOT, um, because they just aren't very good. So bear that in mind. The 16 valve cars require 98 run unleaded at all times, so that's super unleaded. Uh, the early eight valves can be tuned to run on normal unleaded, but you get a better result if you run them on super. The later Digifant eight valves can run on un normal unleaded quite happily as they'll detune themselves automatically to match. Uh, so bear that in mind uh, that you need to use super uh, in quite a lot of these cars uh, to get the best out of them and, and help them to run properly. Now there's something else to be aware of um, when it comes to the Golf uh, in the engine bay. That is the chassis number, which is located here on the bulkhead. Um, there are two chassis number types. There's what's called type 19 and type 1G. Uh, it makes absolutely no difference which one of those you get. Um, quite a few people in the Volkswagen community will rave on about the type 19 being the original car. It doesn't mean anything at all. It's just a code. Okay, so don't get suckered into buying something that's a type 19 in the fact that it's going to be more rare and more valuable than anything else. It isn't. Um, either a type 19 or a type 1G is absolutely fine. Now the Golf did go through a ver few variations over the years. The original cars had quarter light windows and the uh, door mirrors were pushed back a little bit uh, to take that into account. Um, this is a later car with the one piece front windows, uh, which you know, I prefer just from a tidiness perspective. This is still a small bumper car. Uh, later cars came with big bumpers. Which one you prefer is kind of really up to you. Uh, none of them are particularly more valuable than others and there were plenty of them made, so take your choice. A lot of people prefer the smaller bumpers because they look a little bit more classic and old school. Some people prefer the big bumpers because uh, it's the final um, evolution of the Mark II Golf. Uh, neither are more particularly more desirable than others, so go with the one that uh, you prefer yourself. Now there are a few little things that set a 16 valve in particular apart from the other GTIs. You'll notice you're supposed to have a bee sting aerial on the roof. Uh, there are 16 valve badges on the back underneath the GTI badge. You'll also see a GTI badge with a 16 valve moniker on the front of the car. And as you saw inside, there's a little 16 valve badge on the glove box. And that is it. That's the only thing that distinguishes the 16 valve from the outside uh, from a regular GTI. One thing the 16 valve does have is slightly bigger brakes on some of the examples. Basically after 1989 they fitted 256 millimeter front discs as opposed to the standard 239 millimeter brakes that were found on all the other Golfs. Uh, so that's a worthwhile addition. It doesn't make a huge difference but it's uh, slightly more reassuring when you're braking. Um, the only other thing that a 16 valve has that the 8 valve doesn't is slightly lowered suspension. Now, suspension is very much a choice. Now, this car has been returned to standard suspension, and by many standards, it rides a little bit too high compared to modern cars, and it's a little bit soft and squishy by modern handlings, but that's authentic for the car. What you want on your car is entirely up to you. Um, I would certainly recommend against cheap coilovers because they totally ruin the ride, um, unless you're young and you can cope with such things. Um, I've gone for a standard suspension because I'm trying to keep the car 100% original as it would have come out of the factory. So, but there's plenty of choices on the market. Do your research and choose the one that you prefer. The same thing can be said about the exhaust. Now, this is the standard exhaust on the GTI. You can tell it's standard. It has a s two, two exits and a slight uh, angle of rake to the way the, uh, the uh, pipes come out. Um, again, there'll be loads and loads of options for you. Um, you don't have to stick with standard. Exhausts are relatively easy to change. Uh, the car is quite noisy already, so you may want to factor that in. Um, you may want to go for something slightly different for looks, but that is what a standard car is supposed to look like as a reference. In terms of wheels, well, these are the BBS RA. These are 15 inch uh, fairly stock GTI wheels. Very, very common. Um, nothing particularly special, but they do suit the GTI rather nicely and I prefer them as a stock wheel. You'll find the car is cheaper to insure if you leave it standard as well, which is another bonus. Um, however, if you want to change them, you've got loads and loads of choice. Personally, I wouldn't go one above, uh, one inch above stock size as a maximum. So these are 15 inch. These are the biggest wheels that were ever fitted to a Mark II. Uh, you can go to 16 without too much trouble. I wouldn't go much further than that. Uh, a, you'll be uh, ruining the ride and handling of the car. And, um, you know, it starts to look a bit weird and ungainly on larger alloys because it just simply wasn't designed to work with them. 
As for driving the Golf, you expect a car to be uh, cleanly exhilarating. There shouldn't be any hesitation in the rev range, any stuttering or anything like that under partial throttle or low revs in high gears. You need to treat with suspicion. The fuel injection system can cope with that when it's in top shape. So anything like that, again, is cause for concern. The car should not have any uh, flutter or uh, stutter under exhilaration of any kind. They're not particularly fast by modern standards. Um, the standard eight valve car has 112 brake horsepower, 114 pound foot of torque. And the 16 valve as we have here has 139 brake horsepower and 124 pound foot of torque. They are not monster numbers, um, but it's a relatively light car at about 980 kilos. So it doesn't go too badly, but don't expect it to uh, be competitive with any kind of modern hot hatch. That's really performance has moved on. Uh, you'll be lucky to get a eight valve car to do naught to 60 in eight and a half seconds. And if you get eight dead in the 16 valve, you're doing pretty well. In terms of colors, you've got quite a lot of choice. This car is uh, in what's known as tornado red, although it'll probably slow, show up as slightly tornado pink under this lighting um, because cameras do struggle to represent the color well. Um, you've got white, you've got black, you've got various shades of blue, you've got some greens in there. There's a very popular color called oak green, uh, which again is jolly nice if you like that sort of thing. Um, but to be honest, no particular color is more valuable than any other color. Um, so, um, you know, choose the color you like and don't let it uh, uh, make you walk away from a particularly good car. Interior wise, you're going looking for something that again, hasn't been hacked around too much. The dashboard should be in pretty good condition. This one's running its original stereo from back in the eighties, which does still work. The dashboards shouldn't be too hacked about. This is a slightly earlier model. Uh, there are two electrical generations of Golf called CE1 and CE2. You can tell a CE1 car because the hazard switch is up here on the dashboard. The CE2 cars have the hazard switch on a little uh, button in here, which is actually slightly less ergonomic. In terms of the dashboard itself, you should have a, uh, a digital clock in the center, um, which has uh, the multifunction actuator, the MFA, on, um, on a stalk here on the dashboard. Uh, give that a press. This button on the end here uh, changes the modes and you should see clock, uh, miles, mile per hour, miles per gallon, oil temperature and outside temperature uh, working correctly. You want to see that working to make sure the little computer that comes with the car is OK. Um, when you're driving along, keep an eye on the temperature gauge. It should sit just to the right of that LED when the car is fully warmed up. If it's not there, uh, if it's too, if it's running too cold, that means your uh, thermostat is, is wrong for whatever reason. If it's running any higher than the center of uh, just to the right of that LED, then there's something wrong with the car and it's overheating. You won't find many creature comforts in the Golf. Um, there are very, very, very few rare models with air conditioning, but that's uh, very, very unusual to find nowadays. Most of them will have very, very basic controls, a three speed fan, um, rear fog lights, rear demist, hazard warning lights. Uh, this one does have electric windows, which is again fairly rare on the Mark II. You have typical ashtray. Um, you will have a five-speed gearbox. Make sure you get your golf ball gear knob. That's a very distinguishing feature of the Mark II. Over this side, you've got lights on and off on the dashboard dimmer. And that is basically it. You do have a handbrake control down between the seats there. 16 valve is supposed to have a little badge here on the left of the glove box, just to tell you that you are in fact in a 16 valve car. Um, the other things to bear in mind is that the interior trim uh, is getting quite hard to come by. So make sure the car that you get, uh, the interior trim is in good condition all the way through around the car. Make sure the seats are in good condition. These items can be found and sourced, but they are getting extremely expensive to do so. A few other bits about the interior. Uh, the Golf was never particularly highly specced. This one actually is relatively luxurious with the fact it's got electric windows. Obviously make sure those work. It has manual interior adjustable wing mirrors. That's fairly common on the Golf. Um, down here you have a nasty little spot where the, uh, the service history book is supposed to sit. Uh, some of the Golfs may still have that. Uh, this panel here, just out of curiosity, as you can see, is actually where the manual choke for some of the cars went. That doesn't apply to the GTIs. Uh, some of the cars will have power steering. This particular one doesn't. Uh, again, that's down to personal preference. There's no particular reason to buy one or the other as long as it's working. Um, the purists will say that the uh, non-power assisted cars are slightly better feel, but um, it does make them pretty heavy to drive, particularly at low speeds. So you may want to consider power steering, but that was only an option from about 1990 
onwards, so you're unlikely to find power steering cars before that time. In terms of the interior, it's typically golf dull. One of the big problems that you have in this car is suffering from it, as you can see at the back there, is that the headlining tends to come away from the roof. It's not game over, it's just something you have to factor in. Almost all Mark II Golfs are now beginning to suffer from this problem, so that's something to bear in mind as work that you will probably have to do on the car. Other than that, make sure that all the interior equipment is simply present and in good condition. There isn't too much to go through. Um, you're not really looking at mileage on these cars unless you find something really, really, really nice that's low mileage. Expect to see upwards of 150,000 miles in most cases. These cars wear their numbers quite well, and as a result, um, will still look good um, coming up for 200,000 miles. Buy them on condition, don't buy them on mileage is my advice. When you're buying one and have a look at the paperwork, make sure there's a great big stack of receipts showing that the car's been looked after. Uh, this particular car has a massive A4 binder full of receipts that go back to when it was brand new. Uh, and it's even got the original bill of sale and the advert for the car and the original brochure. These are all nice things which just help add to the value if you're planning on keeping the car long term. In terms of the electrics themselves, make sure they all work. There's no reason why they shouldn't be, even on a car of this age. So your three speed fan uh, should work on all three speeds. If it only works on the first speed, that means there's a resistor pack failure, uh, which is relatively easy to replace. Um, the fan itself is actually down there behind the, uh, the dashboard, which is quite easy to get out and replace. There are still replacements available. What you don't really want to see is any cracks in the dashboard, which have been caused by heat over the years. So um, have a good, long, hard look. Make sure everything's in really good condition. There isn't a great deal inside here to worry about. Um, the uh, interior is pretty simple and um, there is an interior light, uh, which goes on and off, obviously, with the doors. Uh, you may find a few period accessories like this uh, Fischer cassette box, all quite nice little things to have if that floats your boat. Um, and that is about it for the interior. One thing that is worth bearing in mind and check under the engine bay for this is to whether the heater matrix has been done. So ask the current owner if they know. Um, most of the heater matrixes on the Mark II will have been replaced by now, but not all of them have. Uh, symptoms of a failing heater matrix is uh, quite dramatic actually. What will happen is coolant will suddenly spray into the car under quite high pressure and at very, very high temperature um, all over you or your passenger from the footwell and sometimes even through the vents here. So um, check that the heater matrix has been replaced because if it does go bang, it can be quite dramatic and actually quite dangerous, particularly if you're driving at the time. So uh, do bear that one in mind and it's something to be, uh, be checked over. In terms of driving it, um, don't expect it to feel particularly quick, particularly at low revs. These are normally aspirated engines. They don't have turbochargers, so they are not going to feel particularly quick. You're going to need to give it some revs in order to make it move. The GTI gearbox is, is fairly standard. It's a five speed uh, in most cars, although some of the early ones will have four speeds. Um, it's fairly normal. It's got a fairly long throw. There's nothing particularly special about it. It should engage all gears without any problem. The only thing you may notice is when you go into second gear when driving, the car may give a very nasty crunch. Uh, that is a relatively common problem, particularly on the GTI gearbox. Uh, the car can go on for a long, long time with that issue. Uh, it can only really be solved by a gearbox problem, but it's not a reason to walk away from a car. A crunchy second gear is very, very common, particularly when the car is cold. So just make sure that you do a gentle gear change into second if you notice that the car has got that problem. A couple other things just to consider when you're looking at the GTI engine after the uh, oil leak stuff is how well the car drives uh, and does it smoke at all. Uh, if you're driving a car and it smokes when you put your foot down, uh, you're probably looking at a car with uh, warm piston rings. Again, not impossible to deal with, but it does mean uh, you know, an engine rebuild. Uh, conversely, if you're looking at a car where uh, uh, it doesn't smoke when it's exhilarating, but if you back off and then apply the throttle and it starts smoking at that point quite noticeably, you're probably looking at valve stem um, oil seals um, at the top of the engine needing replacing as well. All of this stuff is relatively common on the Golf engine. These are pretty old now and they've done quite a lot of miles. Uh, another thing on the 16 valve is the head doesn't have any ventilation, unlike the uh, 8 valve cars. Um, all the uh, ventilation for the 16 valve is actually done through the crankcase, which is down here. Um, and the, the pressure there can build up as the car gets older. And unfortunately, due to the design of the car, that means that oil can be chucked directly into the airbox and you can get a massive, massive plume of smoke come out under some conditions, particularly at high revs. Uh, this particular car is fitted with a catch can. 
uh, as you can see, which gets rid of the worst of that particular problem. Um, it probably can be fixed with a, uh, an engine rebuild, but apparently even brand new 16 valves suff suffered with uh, uh, oil being sucked into the airbox, which is a slightly peculiar design aimed at uh, better emissions. But as you can see, the oil pipe goes directly into the airbox on top of the air filter, which means that hot oil can be sprayed into your air filter actually by design, which is a bit of a weakness on these cars. So bear that in mind, particularly if you're looking for a 16 valve car, that is a problem that you might encounter. And a catch can, a uh, very simple device off eBay here, really nothing too expensive, can help uh, remove the worst of that particular symptom. So bear that one in mind. But in general terms, your Golf should not be using much oil. Um, unless it's a 16 valve, um, the lower model cars do not use much in the way of oil. Obviously, they appreciate good oil changes. Um, do that change at least every 10,000 miles or every year, and the engine should run on quite happily um, for, for, for a very long time indeed. Obviously, all the standard car checks in terms of uh, a rust and so on and so forth apply. Um, make sure that there's no uh, mayonnaise in the oil cap. Make sure there's no evidence of oil in the... Uh, um, uh, in the water. Be suspicious of a car that's been warmed up before you go and visit it. You kind of really want to start it from cold if you can. Um, have a look at the dipstick, make sure the oil there is in good condition. And you're basically just looking for a car that has uh, clearly had some TLC lavished on it over the years. Uh, bad cars stand out pretty quickly to the sort of checks I've advertised in this video. Make sure you take your time, take somebody else with you, um, and, um, and uh, uh, go through all the electrics, make sure everything's working. It's a pretty tough car. Um, and in general, the ones that are left are usually ones that have been looked after and in pretty good condition. There will, however, still be some ropey ones out there. Rust, rust, rust is the key thing to look at. Make sure you uh, are bearing that in mind everywhere you're looking across the car. Crash damage, uh, bad engines, bad modifications that have caused other problems elsewhere. Um, standard is the way to go for value. Um, and uh, keep looking around. Uh, don't necessarily obviously buy the first car you see, but wait until you get something that's nice and ticks all the boxes that maybe needs a little bit of extra work to get it back to standard and in 100% condition. And you'll have yourself a lovely classic motor that will serve you well for many, many years to come and will only appreciate in value. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, buyer's guide for the Mark II Golf. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments and uh, good luck and I hope you find a good one.